Boy, would you open us in prayer tonight? Yes, please? I absolutely will. Okay. Um, join me. Um, Father God, I thank you for the depths of the love that you have over each and every person on this beautiful Zoom call. And we just thank you so much, Father, for um, uniting us together, God. There's just so many questions and so much we need to know. And Jesus, we just want to see you high and lifted up over this call and over our nation and every single thing we're all going through. And Jesus, I just love in your word how you say you would never leave us as an orphan, but you gave us your beautiful Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to come right now. We ask you to come in love and we come in power. And we just thank you so much for all the um, the boots on the ground and all that Carla Dean has done, God. And we just thank you for Dr. Richard and um, just everyone who's going to be speaking upon this call tonight. It's just so important. So, Father, I'm asking that you would give us um, eyes to see and ears to hear into your into your spirit so we would understand and have the wise, wise wisdom of God in this season that's purer than peaceable, unwavering, full of good fruit. And God, we ask for your peace, and we ask that the joy of the Lord would always be our strength, God. So bless every single brother and sister on this call tonight, that you would just give them everything they need to do all the things that you have called them to do. And in the beautiful, mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Joy. Thank you very much. Um, she's a prayer warrior, that girl is. Um, she's an intercessor. Um, we need that right now. Um, we need intercession. Um, tonight, I want everyone to uh, really glean from where we are on the vaccines. Um, Dr. Fleming knows a great deal about these vaccines. Uh, he has his own uh, videos that he does. I think that you do them almost daily, if not daily, uh, Dr. Fleming. And um, I want you to be sure and let people know how to see your videos uh, on this call tonight. And then later on, uh, I'm hoping that we have Dr. Uh, Judith uh, Mikovich. Uh, some of you know who she is. Uh, she's best known, I think, with her plandemic. Uh, and so we are going to have her as a guest as well. And when you have questions, I guess you'll need to put them in the chat. Um, and we can, um, what I want, your assignment is going to be, everyone, is to be sure and pass this information on. Because you're not going to get this in the mainstream media. You will not get this. And so I want you to take this information it's, it's good information, it's valid information, and we need to spread it around as much as we possibly can to our own spheres of influence. So with that, uh, Dr. Fleming, uh, why don't you start here and take it over? Well, as I said, Zeli Kirstfest and Jiluka Gnoya, uh, Flemish for Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everyone. Um, 2020 has been a very interesting year. I uh, uh, have frequently commented to people that it's interesting how uh, we will be look, able to look back at this year with 2020 hindsight um, and hopefully come away with some very <clears throat> clear and important messages. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with all of you. <clears throat> um, let me give a little bit of background, I think, about uh, what leads up to SARS-CoV-2 and I figure if I get off track or off topic of what you want me to focus on and whatever time there is, please just let me know and I'll try to come back to that. <clears throat> um, prior to the uh, uh, discovery of penicillin by Sir Alexander Fleming in the early 1900s, infectious disease was the number one cause of death uh, of humans. With the introduction of penicillium, or penicillin as it later became known, penicillium being the mold, and processed foods and more relaxed lifestyles and, and less strenuous workloads, a, a series of other diseases uh, began to evolve, which when looked at are really chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, these are things like heart disease, coronary artery disease, cancer, high blood pressure, strokes, diabetes, obesity, a wide variety of diseases. 
And I joined the American Heart Association in 1976 as the youngest faculty member at that point in time. Um, I became actively involved in talking about heart disease and cholesterol. I was on the initial physician cholesterol education faculties. And I spent uh, the better part of two decades talking to phys physicians and sometimes the lay public about cholesterol and heart disease. But by the uh, uh, mid, well, the early to mid 80s when I went to medical school and then internship residency and fellowship, after completing that in 1992, my focus really became one of trying to sort out why we didn't have a better handle on, on heart disease. And that led me to develop a theory that encompassed why we have heart disease, why we have heart, uh, high blood pressure, cancer, strokes, and the like. And it became known, for lack of a better term, as the Fleming Inflammatory Inflammation and Coronary Cardiovascular Disease Theory. Within that theory, I laid out 12 factors. One of those factors were infectious diseases like bacteria and viruses. And while a lot of people have talked about knowing this theory, which was first presented at American Heart in 94, presented again at American Heart in 95, it was published in a cardiology textbook in 99. From 2000 to 2003, I published a couple papers on bacteria and their role, uh, particularly chlamydia pneumoniae, streptococcus pneumoniae, and helicobacter pylori, and showed how those diseases, when they produced an inflammatory and thrombotic response, actually led to more deaths. And if you treated them, you could reverse that. And then we talked about it on 2020 and 2004. So I kind of had expected with that amount of time that most people were aware of the importance of viruses and bacteria. Um, in fact, at the time I began presenting it, I said that uh, my expectation was I thought that infectious disease would return to be the number one cause of death in the world, only this time through the inflammatory process that they would produce in heart disease and the rest of these diseases. And in fact, if you look at most of the people who've died with SARS-CoV-2, they die from inflammation and blood clots. So if you look at the autopsy studies, you see massive heart attacks and strokes and pulmonary emboli or blood clots in the lungs or other organs or the inflammation that floods the, the lungs that actually produces the acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS, which is where SARS gets its initial name, severe acute respiratory distress syndrome. <clears throat> so the, the, for, for me, that, that's one part of it. The second part of it has to do with how we can actually test for different diseases. And so I happen to be the cardiolo one of the cardiology fellows in training from 89 to 92 when the new nuclear isotopes were being touted as experimental. And um, the result of that work led to uh, a lot of concern on my part from big pharmaceutical companies misrepresenting how their isotopes actually worked and over billing people and over radiating people. But it did lead to me doing something constructive, which was to develop a patented method called FMTVDM, which allows us to image the body and actually measure quantitatively a reproducible value that can be used time and time again. And that's important because when we're looking at something like SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, if, if that was not clear to people, at SARS-CoV-2, you need to have a method of measuring whether the treatment you give to somebody is working or not. And that's what FMTVDM uh, provides. It's the only tool that can actually do that. So for example, there's a lot of conversation about PCR testing and a lot of concern from people about whether that's a valid test or not. So let me state on the record here that it is a valid test, but it is a qualitative test, which means it looks for the presence of something, not the amount of something. And so I think most people appreciate that the replications go on and on and on. And, and, um, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether that makes it valid or invalid. You need to set that aside because PCR merely tests for the presence of genetic material. It does not tell you how well somebody will do 
whether they will become severely ill, whether they won't know that they've got it, or whether they will end up in the hospital. It is merely a qualitative screening tool. Like a mammogram, it's a qualitative screening tool and it doesn't tell you the severity of the problem you have and what you need to do with it. So you, people need to move, I think, beyond the concern of PCR and not get lost in the mire of, of that discussion. What's important is to have a way to measure what's truly happening. So we, we did set up a research study that we've completed. Um, it included 1,800 people all outside of the United States in seven countries, 23 sites. <clears throat> and the treatment protocol looked at a variety of things. It, it provided treatments for, to enhance the immune response, health of the response that is, to also give medications to open the airways of the lungs, which we would normally do for any patient having breathing problems. Um, and then the third one was to define actual treatments. Now, the treatments that I selected, and it took uh, the better part of two to three months just to design the study, um, all were selected because of how they work, not because of what type of drug they are. So, for example, many people are familiar with the drug azithromycin. It is an antibiotic. However, that doesn't matter. It's why the antibiotic works that, that is key. <clears throat> and if one looks back in the medical literature or published papers, you will find that azithromycin has been used to successfully treat Zika virus. It interferes with the replication of the virus. And that is the reason why it's beneficial, not because it might prevent a secondary bacterial infection, but because it interferes with the ability of the virus to replicate itself. So um, this study uh, was carried out, 1,800 people, um, eventually 501 of them ended up in the hospital who got the 10 selective treatment arms. and we were able to define three successful treatments that work 99.83% of the time. And that's, that's critical because currently there is no treatment for SARS-CoV-2 that is that successful. What does bother me is the fact, however, that <clears throat> we have submitted this information. Um, it has been submitted to the White House Task Force. It has been submitted to the FDA. It's been submitted to Health and Human Services. The World Health Organization has been made aware of it, and you see none of these agencies coming out and talking about it. Um, it, it is, as somebody pointed out in an interview I did a week and a half ago, uh, significant because you cannot provide an emergency use author authorization for anything if there is already an approved treatment for that problem. So if they were to come out and say these treatments are available, there would be no role for an emergency use authorization EUA for vaccines. That, that was a very rapid run through and there's a lot of details <laughs> missing, but hopefully that kind of, kind of give you, uh, gives you some information. I'm not looking to see if there's questions being posted. Um, I'm going to leave that to you, Carla Dean, to let me know, is that fair? Yes. Okay. Um, you wanted me to talk about vaccines, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to do that. I think there's some important issues to discuss about vaccines. One is vaccines are designed to produce an immunologic response. We give them to people with the premise that by exposing your body to the virus or the bacteria, that you will make one of two types or perhaps both types of immunologic response. So to walk everybody through this, when you first get exposed to something that is not in your, not a part of your body, that could be a bacteria, that could be a virus, that could be cancer, because that's no longer a natural part of your body. The first thing that happens is you have something called T cells. Now they're called T cells because they originate in a gland called the thymus gland that is located in the center of your chest. 
The other types of cells that are responsible are called B cells or beta cells. They get that name because in chickens, they come from the bursa and from people, they come from bone marrow. So B, so it identifies where they come from. So in the first phase of getting exposed, and we'll just stick now with the virus, to a virus, in about three to four days, your body will make a T cell response. Correctly called, it is the acute, sudden, innate, naturally occurring T cell response. About a week to 10 days after you get exposed to something, you will make what's called an adaptive, because it is present in people, but not lower animals, humor, delayed, because it takes longer to occur, humoral, which is our medical term for antibody response. So you've got a three to four day window and a seven to 10 day window. And then some of those antibodies occur to attack the problem immediately. They're called IgM. Longer term delayed response for future responses are called IgG. But there's also three other types of antibodies. The important one here is IgA because IgA is present in the respiratory airways and in the gastrointestinal tract, both areas where this virus tends to infect. So one of the things that I find most intriguing is that neither of these vaccines, nor Oxford in, in the UK or the others that I've read about, talk about an IgA response, which would be key. Also, if you read through the EUA documents that the FDA had that I'm not sure how many people watched those hearings. Uh, I watched them. I was appalled um, because there weren't any serious scientific questions that were raised during these, during these hearings. If you look at the documents that were presented, none of those documents provide supportive data that shows what antibody responses or what T cell responses occurred. They merely said, 34 out of 34 people for the Pfizer one had a T cell response. That's wonderful. I'd like to know exactly what that response was. And I see no data in the EUA documents to the FDA. And I see no data in the published papers in the medical journals. They also say there's an antibody response. Antibody responses are reported in what's called titers. So we take blood from you if you have antibodies. <clears throat> and we expose it to, in this case, the virus, and it clumps the blood. That's, a, that's what we see. And then we dilute the blood and do it again. And if it responds, then you have a one to two titer. And then we dilute the blood again in half, and that's a one and four titer, then a one and eight. So the greater that number becomes, one in 256, for example, that is, it has more antibodies than a one to one or a one to two. But none of that data is listed in any of the published papers of these vaccines, and it's not listed in the EUA. So my point being that a lot of conversation has occurred about the safety and the efficacy of this vaccine. And I think that people did exactly what was expected. They ran to the safety. And none of you have questioned whether there has been a demonstrable efficacy. In fact, if you look at what was reported the Pfizer vaccine says it will reduce your symptoms. That's its claim. Well, Advil and aspirin will reduce your symptoms, and it didn't cost tens of billions of dollars to develop. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another thing of interest is the fact that there has never terminology. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA positive or sense virus. Um, there has never been a successful vaccine produced to a single-stranded RNA virus. Now, there were vaccines made for SARS-CoV-1 from 2002. There were vaccines made for the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Virus of 2007. And there, there has been a vaccine made for dengue fever. In all three of those instances, there were antibodies made to the people who were injected with the vaccine. However, not all of the antibodies are helpful. 
some of the antibodies actually are harmful to people. Now, for the first, for the SARS-CoV-1, for dengue, and for MERS, if you look at antibodies, they have what's called a regional binding area where they attack, in this case, the virus. But on the other end, they have something called an FC component. That attaches either to cells or to what's called the complement cascade that causes clotting. Now, this is important because the original theory that I put together explaining how viruses can kill people very clearly states that it's due to inflammation and blood clotting. And it occurs when the immune system is not finely tuned, which sets two groups of people up for problems. The immune naive, the very young, people with HIV or other immune deficiency syndromes or diabetics who have naive and poorly developed immune systems, so they're not really well organized or controlled. And another group of people that all of you have come to call as the comorbidities, obese, heart disease, stroke. The reason why these are comorbid conditions that set these people up is because all of these people have a hyperreactive immune system because they already have inflammatory diseases, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, cancer, the list goes on that their body has tuned their system upwards to be responsive to having more inflammation in their body to deal with the health problems that they have. Both of those groups are not finally regulated. So when you ask these people to form antibodies, either naturally to the virus or to a vaccine, doesn't matter, they will end up with the same inflammatory and thrombotic or inflammothrombotic response. And that is what has been killing people. So the vaccine itself poses a threat to the very people that are most potentially going to die from the virus because it's promoting an inflammothrombotic response. The news gets better. <laughs> the Osaka Japan group has been able to sort out whether humans make antibodies to the spike protein, which you've all heard about. It's the part of the protein that, of the virus that allows it to attach to the ACE receptors that prior to 2020, none of you knew there were ACE receptors probably. Um, physicians did, hopefully. But <clears throat> There are two major parts to this S protein. There is the part that attaches to the ACE receptor, and that is called the regional binding domain, RBD. On the other end of the spike protein is something called the N terminal domain or NTD. It turns out that we also make antibodies to the NTD. And since the vaccines have the entire genetic sequence, the mRNA, for the entire spike protein, not only will cells make the regional binding domain, it'll make the rest of the spike protein the N-terminal domain. Why is that a problem? Because the antibodies that we make to the N-terminal domain changes what the N-terminal domain looks like. And with that change, the N-terminal domain causes the regional binding domain, the part that attaches to the ACE receptor, to open up and become more infective. So the antibody response, antibody dependent enhancement, that was for one problem with the prior vaccines, is a completely different problem with this vaccine because of this virus. Now, we really don't know what genetic material they're putting in these vaccines, the mRNA, that means messenger ribonucleic acid. It's in the books, if you wanna go get the books off Amazon, I went through great detail of just walking people through it, but I don't wanna sound like a commercial for selling books. Um, I wanna stay focused as the, the legitimate 
scientist physician that I am. Um, <clears throat> the uh, professor moment, <laughs> Carly, where was I? Um, oh, so the messenger RNA that's, that's supposed to be in these vaccines has a problem that I'm concerned with because just sticking that into the cells of our bodies won't tell our bodies to make it. It needs something more. There's another part of the genetic code and just stay with me here and accept my terms called the open reading frame one, which is the first part of the genetic sequence that when it gets into the cells of the body makes the enzymes necessary to make the virus. If all they put in these vaccines are the mRNA for the spike protein, there is not enough material to get it made, which means either they've stuck something else in there or they've stuck more of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in there than they told us and, and are lying to us. Now, SARS-CoV-2 is not naturally occurring. If you follow the paper trail of what has happened, of the research money that includes National Science Foundation money and the National Institutes of Health, and this would be a portion of the NIH that is the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which Dr. Fauci runs. Grants and money have been provided to make this virus have an increased gain of function. If you look at the spike protein, there are two areas that are not naturally occurring. One is an HIV pseudovirus. Mm -hmm. And the other is a PRRA insert which is exactly what the rabies and rabies virus and cobra venom and the GP120 of HIV looks like. Mm -hmm. Both of those changes increase the infectivity of this virus. And that is why it is spreading like wildfire because this is a human modified virus designed to make it more infective. <clears throat> now, that's called gain of function. About a week, week and a half ago, it dawned on my little brain that the vaccine, which puts the genetic virus material inside a lipid sac, which is what the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines do, and the Oxford vaccine in the UK is an adenovirus or an adenovirus, depending upon where you're at in the United States, which contains the virus inside of it, to allow it to infect cells is also a gain of function because it's been designed to get the virus material inside of a cell. Now, unfortunately, that means this is really a third gain of function. And if you thought that they quit experimenting with this stuff with just when they came out with it, you should think again, because most people that are playing this game don't stop playing the game. They continue to play with it. Here's the thing that hit me a little bit less than a week ago. <clears throat> Since we don't know exactly what they have in these vaccines, and it's a gain of function number three, how do we know that what they put in there isn't SARS-CoV-3? <laughs> if you think about it, <clears throat> once the UK started to vaccinate people, we started to hear about a new variant of the virus that had an increased infectivity of people that now has the world even more panicked. Somebody tried to tell me, Fleming, you must be wrong. We found this variant back in the UK in September. My question is, if this new variant is as easily 
that's transmitted and infecting to people that's causing it to mushroom in the UK right now, why didn't that happen in September if it really showed up in September? And the only logical answer to that is that this is not from September. This is from December and it follows the introduction of the vaccines into the UK. <clears throat> that was a whirlwind of information, was it? <laughs> Curly Dean, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> well, okay, do you, do you want to take questions now? Or do you, uh, I know um, that people have a lot of questions. Here's something, that someone made a comment, by nature, virus can mutate any time. <clears throat> Um, yeah, we know that. Um, so. Okay, so the, I think the question might be the HIV insert and the PRRA, could that just not be naturally occurring? Is that perhaps the question? It could be. Okay. You and could. You could. Kind of above their head and, and, and it's, it's confusing. So try to make it as clear Got it. as a reader. Got it. You could make an argument for a mutation happening. You can't make an argument for two major mutations happening all at once. Now, they, the, the paper trail shows that back in 2007 to 2009, one of the parts of the naturally occurring coronavirus, it's called HKU4, was intentionally modified, I've read the paper, I've put some of the quotes in the book so people can see it, was intentionally modified to make it more infective. That's the HIV insert, pseudovirus insert. <clears throat> the PRRA is not present in any other coronavirus. It's not present in coronavirus one, in MERS or any other variant of coronavirus. Out of the blue air, this thing suddenly, which requires either an insert of four, it's called PRRA because that is, uh, I think it's, I think it's proline, arginine, arginine, and, and I've got it written down somewhere, four specific or a deletion of six. Mutations occur by one, much more than one at a time, and you end up with devastating consequences that kill where the mutation is. For example, sickle cell anemia is a mutation of one. And it produces a major change in what the red blood cells look like, a sickling. The reason why it survived was because in the area of the world in Africa where it occurred, that's where malaria occurred and malaria parasites can't live in sickled cells. So that single mutation had a viable reason for existing and being continued on. But more mutations that don't provide a viable function to something stop because it will kill the organism it's mutating in. So it tends to occur by one, not sets of three or six, and not two major sites such as a PRRA or an HIV pseudovirus. <clears throat> Hopefully that answered that. <clears throat> and so um, with the azithromycin, are you right. saying that, uh, what is its role actually in the uh, COVID treatment? What, what's its role actually, are you saying? Is right. it helpful or not helpful or? Well, it turns out that it really depends upon what it's combined with. So part of what we did is we looked at the 1800 started as outpatients and the doctors had a choice. Everybody had to have a positive um, PCR test and they had to present to a doctor because let's be honest, we shouldn't be doing McDonald's style testing. You should not be able to drive up and get a test like you get a hamburger or a cheeseburger or a, set or, or a package of fries. You don't know what to do with it. It's missing the physician input of, okay, if you have a positive test, you look to me like you need treating or you don't. So let me, um, 
I'm kind of looking at my slide set here and I want to be able to quote actual numbers for you. So we looked at, <clears throat> we allowed the physicians in these settings to decide whether they want to start the patients on medications. About half the people did not get started on medications, even though they had a positive PCR test. And those people, half the time did okay, the other half ended up in the hospital. Um, we just, we, we, we saw, so uh, the basic function of azithromax or azithromycin is to inhibit the replication of the virus inside the cells, much as it does with Zika virus which is problematic when you think about it because the worldwide problem with uh, Zika virus has never been addressed by the World Health Organization, even though it's been shown th that azithromax is beneficial and stops the replication of Zika virus in brain glial cells. Azithromax primarily inhibits the viral protein translation or the, or the replication of the virus. Um, one of the things I think I did want to mention to, and, and I was going to just kind of use the, the slides here to show that, is to point out that there are multiple uh, things that, are, that people don't take into account, for example, with the hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine has multiple actions. One of the things it does is it interferes with the viral RNA replication. Another thing it does is it inhibits the viral attachment to the ACE2 receptor. It also enhances, it's a zinc ionophore, it increases zinc coming into the cell, which interferes with the replication of the virus. It also enhances the production of type one interferons. And uh, it also, um, let's see, it increases slightly cellular pH, although don't get confused, these aren't major changes. And that slight increase in cellular pH decreases the ability of the cell to then take the uh, outer uh, capsule, if you will, off the virus to allow the genetic material to get into the cells. It also uh, inhibits the TOL7 receptors, which are responsible for inflammation. It, it decreases other pro-inflammatory cytokines, and it also inhibits a blood clotting factor known as glycoprotein 2B3A. So where the general world, where Dr. Fauci and everybody out there is trying to convince the world that these drugs don't work, they're not looking at what these drugs actually do. What we saw was the best outcome we saw was actually when primaquin, which is another aminoquinolin, and hydroxychloroquine and clindamycin were given together as outpatients or inpatients. Now, clindamycin interferes with another part of the cell with a transmembrane receptor for serine proteases too. And that had other people, I think, done their work and, and looked at prior research would have been known to interfere with the ability of viruses to get into cells. So the best outcomes that we saw were actually both inpatient and outpatient with primaquin and clindamycin. And you may or may not add hydroxychloroquine in there. The difference was between 97 and 100% efficiency. Um, that if you think about it <clears throat> is, significantly better than the nonsense that's going on right now. And in fact, if you look at what one of my concerns is that they don't want this information to get out because if they were to realize that these treatments are effective, but of course they need to be implemented sooner than later, they no longer have a selling pitch for selling vaccines. Now, I've, I've told this to people before, and I see Judy nodding her head. If the vaccines could actually be proven to be safe and effective, I would be on board, okay? But they haven't proven that they're effective. I know all the rest of you are worried about whether they're safe, but they haven't proven they're effective. They haven't proven that they stop viral attachment or replication. In fact, the data out of Japan shows 
that if in fact what they're putting in there is the spike protein, that we will make antibodies to that N-terminal domain that will eventually cause the ACE, the regional binding domain, the part that attaches to the ACE receptor to open up and increase infectivity. And as I said earlier, the fact that we don't know what they're putting in there and the fact that they've already played with the virus twice and the fact now that they have a vaccine mechanism for delivery that is a third gain of function, I firmly, I will believe until proven otherwise that the vaccines being used, at least in the UK, are SARS-CoV-3. Oh my. Oh my. Uh, that is a sobering <clears throat> thought that we might be vaccinating people with the virus. Yeah. And, 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 and giving this to older people or people with comorbidities will, if it does what they say, produce an antibody response, set these people up for dying from the inflammothrombotic response that the theory that I put together states will happen. And this is why the people are dying in the first place. It doesn't matter with matter whether your antibody response is naturally occurring and you end up in the hospital or whether we give you the vaccine to cause the antibody response, it is still an antibody response. So I don't see how you play this well and look good to come across the board. And I've said this before, Donald Trump is not a scientist. <clears throat> he's not gonna know diddly squat about what I tell him or Judy tells him or, or any real researcher is gonna tell him because he's a businessman. And I swear, yeah, I, I know nothing about business. You do not wanna take business advice from me. You don't wanna bet on the stock market from me. I don't pretend to be a businessman. I don't pretend to be a politician. So I don't fault him, but the people that are in the science community know what's going on. And before I turn it over to Judy, because I know my time is probably, no, I have another 15 minutes, don't I? <laughs> Sorry, Judy, <laughs> just nod your head for me. I'm, um, good. I'm good, enjoy. <laughs> the, uh, the reality is, is that if you follow the money trail, we know that this has been human modified. Peter Dazek and EcoHealth, Dr. Fauci, Bill Gates, and a whole host of players have been involved in manipulating in one manner or another, either the development of this virus or the hiding of treatments that work or the promotion of, treatment, of, of vaccines that can very well be harmful when they're not needed. And I believe in my heart of hearts, and Judy may have seen some of the stuff that I'm posting on Twitter, that not only am I pushing to get these treatments out to get physicians to be able to practice medicine again. I mean, I know that some of the outpatient stuff needs to be boosted in its scientific proof, but I would rather have outpatient doctors lack scientific proof and rely upon their gut instinct than to see scientists and politicians hide stuff behind the scenes. So I am personally, personally, pushing not only for this information to get out, for doctors like Dr. Urso to be able, that I see online here, to be able to treat people in the way that his information tells him he's successfully treating people. But I am also calling for the prosecution and the criminal charging of these individuals in international court for crimes against humanity. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> agreed. I fully agreed. I had someone that just said, well, we've had COVID-19, uh, uh, so should we get the vaccination? Since we've already had COVID-19, would you suggest <clears throat> we get the vaccination? Well, my response is everything I just said. My response has nothing to do with the fact that whether they may or may not have an antibody response already mounted, that they responded to it. My response remains the same, unchanged, which is if you take the vaccine, you will supposedly have an antibody response. If that vaccine 
is SARS-CoV-2 and you make N-terminal domain antibodies, it will increase the infectivity of the virus. If that vaccine is SARS-CoV-3, you, you will be injected with a brand new virus that your body has not seen with the in intent that you form either T-cell or antibody responses, both of which are associated with morbidity, harm, and mortality, death, in the groups of people that are either immune naive or have the comorbidities who already have a hyper reactive immune system. To answer your question another way, I believe I developed I, that I have was exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in January. I was sicker than I've been in five or 10 years. There were actually a couple of days there that if you know my personality, I don't think you, I don't drink coffee. OK, first, I don't like the flavor of it. And secondly, you don't want to see me on caffeine. OK, I don't need caffeine to speed me up. So when I tell you that I took a couple of days and actually found a couple of times during the day that I went and laid back down on a bed for five to 10 minutes, trust me, I did not feel well. I will not be taking the vaccine. If I take the vaccine, you will see me on TV being held down by many people having it jabbed in my arm. And unlike Dr. Fauci, I will remember which arm it was put in. I don't know if you understand the, the meaning of that. Dr. Fauci was injected with his left arm, in his left arm, in his left deltoid. The next day when he said, so left deltoid. The next day when he was asked by the media how he was doing, he says, oh, nothing but just a little pain. And he patted his right deltoid. So he's either undergone dementia or he doesn't remember where he was stuck. And we usually stick people in their non-dominant arm, which would be his left arm, because he threw the pitch out in his right arm. Although, frankly, based upon that pitch, I'm not sure that's his dominant arm. <laughs> Yes. All right. Okay. Uh, well, that should have gotten me in enough trouble. Yeah. Uh, would you say a few things about uh, what mRNA is? There's a question here. Okay. Is so mRNA. Right. So you basically have um, you have genetic material. You have something called deoxyribonucleic acid. That's DNA. That is your genetic information that you got from your mother and father put together. Most people think it only exists in the nucleus of the cells. It also exists in the mitochondria of cells. That is our basic genetic code. To make proteins or to make anything from our body, what, hap what has to happen is DNA has to unravel and you make from deoxyribonucleic acid, you make something called ribonucleic acid or RNA. There's a slight difference. Uh, thymidine is replaced with uracil. So it's ribonucleic acid and it's a single strand. There's three types. There's transfer, there is uh, <laughs> mRNA. Um, those are the two basic ones that would be used in the ribosomes. And that RNA gets fed through the ribosomes inside your cell and from it, you make proteins. So mRNA is single-stranded genetic material that uh, allows proteins to be made like spike proteins and the rest of the, of the viral protein that then gets put back together. So it's single-stranded genetic material and it stands for ribonucleic acid. <clears throat> Um, that I think they want to know its role in these vaccines. Why have they oh. putting mRNA RNA in these vaccines now? I mean, okay. what, what's the point? Well, this became just simply a different method of getting it into the cell. And in, instead of giving the virus to somebody and having it outside the cell and then having it have to find its way to get into the cell and then having our bodies respond to it, what they decided to do was to just take the genetic material from the virus and stick it into our cells, which is why I said, this is a new gain of function. This is a third gain of function. 
not only did they play with this to get it inside our cells more efficiently by putting an HIV pseudovirus on it or a PRRA component on it, they've actually talked us into the place where we were so desperate as a world for a vaccine and the promise that that had, that they talked us into allowing them to package it up in a way that I believe that they realized simply made it easier to get into the cell, and which is another gain of function. You don't need to give mRNA to get this done, but they have been able to manipulate the system into a place where we were so desperate that we were willing to go along with whatever method. And now all of these vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, Oxford, are all three different methods for getting just the genetic material of this virus into our cells. Not in your wildest imagination do I think you woke up any day in your life saying, let me find a way to allow Big Pharma and the government a way to inject material into the cells of my body that are from a different living organism. Judy, acknowledge this with me. This, this is not an exosome nonsense. Viruses are real and they come from outside the body. Um, would you make a comment also, I see here in the chat room, it says here the PCR testing uh, that is 30 to 40 cycles. Okay. Uh, so, and so, um, so this, they, this, they suggested about not using to identify the virus. What's going on with that? See, this, this is where I said, don't get lost in the minutia of things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. The PCR test is a very good test that is a qualitative test. It only tells you if something is present or not. You and I and Dr. Urso and, and other physicians make a decision about whether patients need to be treated or not. PCR tests do not. They tell us the genetic material that is part of that virus is present. I don't care if they have to multiply it once or a trillion times. It's no more valuable to me. Its value to me is that it tells me you have these viral particles in your nose or your throat, wherever they swabbed it, period. End of discussion. It became, it's a screening tool that says, yep, you've got it. What doesn't it do? It doesn't tell you anything more than that. It doesn't tell you how much of it you've got. It doesn't tell you how bad you're going to react to it. It doesn't tell you whether you're going to be asymptomatic. It doesn't tell you whether your T cells are going to kick in and take over for it in three to four days. It doesn't tell you if you're going to need antibody, uh, your, your body to make antibodies to it. It doesn't tell you whether you're going to give it to somebody else. It doesn't, well, increase it's that likelihood, but it doesn't tell you if you're going to end up in the hospital. It simply tells you what it's designed to do, which is, is it there? Period. Great. It's McDonald's. And I know of no other virus in the world or infectious disease that we have pan cultured everybody on the planet. And I know of no other disease on the planet that we've quarantined the healthy We, we quarantine ill people and we treat people that are symptomatic. So these doctors, when they saw these 1800 patients, the decisions they made about whether they put them on a treatment or not was based upon, they all had a positive PCR test. So the doctors had to make a decision. Do I think this patient needs treatment? Well, you know, Dr. Graves, Dr. Urso, any other doctors out there, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Finn, I mean, we look at patients and we make clinical decisions that yes, you need treatment. Today. Dr. Dr. Fleming, this is Dr. Kelly Victory. If I can just interject, <laughs> I think what might help. Absolutely. Uh, well, what might help? Hi. What might help some of the non-clinicians to understand with the PCR test is right. that it picks up 
even fragments of virus that if you spread them on a Petri dish, would not replicate. They, we couldn't grow virus. They aren't meaningful. The example I use to people is I say, it would be like my finding a human hair on the floor of this room and coming to the conclusion that that person is still in the room. They may have been there months ago. It's an insignificant fragment of virus that doesn't mean that you have the disease. Right, and I say from, from my standpoint in treating patients, it's not helpful because just as Dr. Fleming said, it doesn't really give me the information that I need to know at what stage are we in? Are we going to go on and, and actually develop something? Uh, are we going to go on? I mean, right. it, it's not a helpful clinician tool for sure. And uh, so it is to me, now, what do you think is the best testing, Dr. Fleming? At this, okay. okay. I mean, so, I, so I have do you do with this. Right. I have two comments. I do think it's a useful test to have, and here's why. And it's never where people think it's coming from. In the city of Los Angeles, the new epicenter for SARS-CoV-2, we are also the epicenter for something else tuberculosis. How do we know that? Because they kept swabbing people for P PCR tests for SARS-CoV-2 and they kept coming up with negatives and they kept getting frustrated because these people were short of breath and they were coughing. They kept swabbing them. They were negative. Some doctors here got smart and got chest x-rays and guess what they discovered? All those people that were coughing that had negative PCR tests had tuberculosis on their chest x-rays. So it was useful because it finally pounded over the heads of enough people that the only thing going on in this world is not SARS-CoV-2. Now, I know that's not where people think about when they think about doing a PCR test. But from that point of view, it helped. What is the test? Okay. Well, this sounds very self-serving, so I apologize. There is only one test. Well, this is, okay, let me do this. You can look for the antigen. You can look to see if the virus is present. Present. That's the PCR test. And Dr. Victory, I liked your analogy. It was an excellent analogy, an excellent explanation. It says there's material there, but it doesn't tell you whether it's, it's even all of the material. It doesn't tell you there's going to be diddly squat. It just tells you you've got something that at least was part of it. And congratulations, by the end of 2022, everybody's going to have these particles in their throat, just like everybody on planet Earth has strep bacteria in their throat. Um, <clears throat> you can test for antibodies. Outstanding. They're testing for IgG and IgM, which is great, except that, as I already said earlier, golly gee, it's an IgA. A antibody we should be looking for anyway, since it's an airway and GI tract problem. So finding those antibodies, does that tell you much? Does it tell you you can't get sick again? Does it tell you anything? No, it says you got exposed to it. You made antibodies. Congratulations. Here's a sucker. Um, that's what they did in the pediatrician's office for the kids in the younger days. The third approach is to get tissue information. Now, you can either do a you either go into the lungs of people, it's called a bronchoalveolar lavage, go in with a scope, go into their lungs, put some saline in there, suck stuff back out and look for it and have people decide whether they think they see SARS-CoV-2 or if they have an electron microscope to really do it right. Or you can use the patented test that I developed called FMTVDM that took me two decades to develop that I was developing originally for heart disease and cancer. And we have used it for measuring the severity of those diseases. And it also allows us to know whether your treatment is working because it's a measurement, it's a yardstick or it's a scale, if you will. So what it says in Los Angeles, it says the same thing in New York or in Tokyo or in Paris. So. FMTVDM I made available for free when this study started. And because it only takes three days for these treatments to have an effect, 
Anybody who got hospitalized got an FMTVDM and two blood tests, one called ferritin and one called interleukin-6 that are inflammatory markers. Then they got started on a single drug treatment. And three days later, we repeated FMTVDM. If they got better, by definition, they were kept on that treatment. If they got worse, by definition, that treatment was stopped and a new one was randomly added. And if they did neither, but they kind of stayed in the same place, they had another treatment randomly added to the first. And we kept doing that until either we got success or a dead patient. Out of 1,800 people, we lost three. That doing it that way with 10 drugs in house, in hospital, allowed me to come up with 52 drug combinations that we were then able to analyze and see what works. And there are three drug combinations for SARS-CoV-2 that work 99.83% of the time in critically ill hospitalized patients. The first one is if they have an aminoquinoline, be that hydroxychloroquine or primaquine, combined with one of the antibiotics, and the best one was clindamycin, and behind that was azithromycin, and falling behind that was doxycycline. If they had that combination as an outpatient and then came into the hospital, there were two drug treatments that we eventually came up with that when initially given to patients, knocked this virus down. So where we started with 40 to 60 days in the hospital, by the time the studies were done and we were doing this right, patients were out in one to two weeks. One of those treatment combinations was methoprednisolone. You might note somebody on Pennsylvania Boulevard who was taking hydroxychloroquine before he was admitted to the hospital, who then got methoprednisolone and the media was just aghast that in two or three days, this man was trying to get out of the hospital to run the country. The second combination instead of methoprednisolone was a combination of tocilizumab, which is a medication that can be given to interfere with interleukin-6 and the inflammation and clotting going on, when combined with interferon alpha-2 beta. Interferons get their name because they interfere with viral replication. The third treatment combination and doctors, if you want to send me an email and you have a question, I will give you the exact doses of this for you to have available. Um, <clears throat> because I realized as I was preparing the presentation for next year, Judy, <laughs> that I, I needed to provide the exact information and doses for people in these presentations. Um, the third combination was if they had not gotten and aminoquinoline is an outpatient. And by the way, these aminoquinolines appear to prime the control of this virus. So even when people needed to be admitted to the hospital, they responded much faster if they had already received outpatient aminoquinoline treatment. But for those who had not, the combination for them was primaquine clindamycin, tocilizumab, and interferon alpha-2 beta. Now, the beautiful thing about having done all of this work is not only finding these three treatments that work. SARS-CoV-2, you'll love this, Judy, confirmed the Fleming inflammation and cardiovascular disease theory because it proved that the virus caused this inflammatory thrombotic effect that killed people. Not the way I wanted that theory to be proven, but nonetheless proven. But what it means is the next time they try this cute little stunt, 
we already know what drugs work on these viruses, even though we haven't been calling them antivirals. We know which drugs work and we know that we can use FMTVDM to measure the treatment response and put the next one to bed in short order. That takes away the power of these people that have been playing and gaming this system and manipulating all of us. I will say that everybody in addition to these treatments got Atrovent to open their airways without increasing their heart rate. I wanna say another thing about hydroxychloroquine while I'm thinking about it. All this huss and fuss about, now for the general public, you won't, you all understand, everybody talked about heart rhythm problems that occurred, that somehow this was gonna cause heart problems. Well, as a cardiologist, because that's, I'm a physicist cardiologist slash attorney, um, I've known about these heart rhythm problems with antibiotics and other drugs for a long period of time, but it doesn't stop us from using them. For the physicians, QT prolongation is a problem because it causes ventricular polymorphic tachycardias or torsade de poids. Notice that none of the papers that were ever published about side effects from hydroxychloroquine state that anybody had ventricular polymorphism or torsade de poids. In other words, even though they've all said, all those papers said that hydroxychloroquine and those drugs were bad for the rhythm of the heart, not a single one of those papers provided a single patient as a case example. We monitored that part of the heart rhythm, QT, on everybody who came in. And the only thing to report is there's nothing to report. The other thing is that as part of the study protocol, we also had a drug available that shortens the QT interval called Esmolol. Nobody needed it, but isn't it interesting how doctors give patients medications every day of the year and every day of the year, patients have side effects. And instead of throwing the drug out that's working, the first thing we usually ask is, how bad is the side effect and what can I do to address it? We don't say, throw the drug out and let's start over from scratch. Everybody's perspective who says, throw out hydroxychloroquine because it's this bad rhythm drug, none of them provided any evidence or papers showing that. And none of them bothered to realize that if they needed it, they could get this other drug called Esmolol. They could also get magnesium, which is one of the antidotes for these bad rhythms. And in fact, everybody in the study did get magnesium. They got calcium. They got vitamin C. They got vitamin D, B, B9, B6, B12, DHEA, and D3. <clears throat> oh, Yes. If they committed fraud when they issued that uh, EUA in June the 15th of this year, when they uh, changed the rules there, they committed fraud. I agree with what Dr. Fleming said. Well, I think they need to be taken to international court for I crimes think. against humanity. I'm serious about this. Well, there are about 50 medications that we prescribe on a daily basis without thinking that have QT interval uh, implications far greater than hydroxychloroquine, uh, including albuterol and Zofran and all the quinolones and yeah. a lot of the medications that we never even think about. This was a trumped up, pardon the pun, made up, uh, made up concern about hydroxychloroquine. 